Hey there, folks. I'm... As part of my wall-mounted computer build, I deleted an Intel 14700K to enable direct dye water cooling. I wanted to separate that content out on its own into a short tutorial video to help others who might be interested in such a thing, while also eliminating the burden of wading through what Paul Harvey might call the rest of the story. Therefore, in this shorter segment, I'll demonstrate how I delid Intel 14th Gen processors without any extra fluff. If you have already watched episode 3 of my wall-mounted computer build, this video won't contain any new content for you. The DLID tools I use for Intel 13th and 14th Gen CPUs are the EK Quantum Velocity 2 IHS Removal Tool and the Rocketcool Intel DLID Tool. Let me show a quick demonstration for how these tools work. Up first is the EK IHS Removal Tool. There is a main tool housing and a reversible sliding insert to push and pull the IHS off the CPU. There is a side 1 which pulls the IHS forward to a certain point, and once it reaches that point, you flip the CPU around to side 2, reorient the slider to accommodate side 2, then push the IHS back in the direction it came from. EK's own usage instructions state to repeat this process a few times. When looking at the CPU, this is how the two motions work together to eventually shear the IHS free. One thing to note about this motion is that it operates back and forth on the long side of the CPU. On to the Rocketcool DLID tool. By comparison, this is a simpler tool and comes apart at the center into these two pieces. The triangle marking in this corner is meant to align with the corner of the CPU that also has the triangle mark. With the CPU oriented correctly, you bring the two parts together again and thread the three top screws into position and then it's ready to crank. There is a singular motion to this tool. When the large cap head screw is turned, the pusher exerts force on the IHS until it shears free. This action occurs on the short edge of the CPU and something I do like about the direction of the action is that it occurs in a single direction away from the SMDs. For this demonstration, I'm going to use the Rocketcool DLID tool. Regardless of the tool you choose to use, always be aware of the position of the SMDs on the surface of the CPU. SMD is an acronym for Surface Mounted Device, and generically refers to electronic components mounted on the surface of a piece of hardware. While both of the tools I mentioned are keyed and marked to make them as safe as possible, Incorrectly orienting the CPU and attempting to use either tool could very easily damage or destroy the CPU that you are working with. On to the DLID process. Let's cut the factory seal, get the box open, and remove the CPU. I'll lay the processor on a heat resistant silicone mat, and using a variable temperature heat gun configured to output 75 degrees, warm the IHS for 2 to 3 minutes. Once the CPU is warmed, I'll quickly transfer it to the DLID tool with the triangle on the CPU lined up to the triangle on the tool. Next, I'll insert the three flathead countersunk screws and tighten them down. With the screws in place, I'll take a larger hex key, insert it into the cap head screw on the side of the DLID tool, and start to turn. After a few rotations of the wrench, a somewhat blood curdling crackle is heard. This sound was the IHS shearing free from the indium sheet and the gasket glue. All of the Intel CPUs I've ever deleted have manifested this sound, so hearing it isn't a cause for concern. With the primary separation complete, I'll unscrew the three top screws and remove the top half of the tool housing. While applying a very small amount of topside pressure on the IHS to control its position, I'll use a small flat edge tool to slide the IHS from the die and directionally do that away from the SMDs. Once I can grab it with my fingers, I'll gently lift the IHS from the CPU, revealing the die underneath. Now it's time to clean the die and remove the glue gasket from the perimeter of the CPU. With the CPU still in the DLID tool, I'll use masking tape to surround the die and protect the rest of the surface area. Once the tape has been applied, I'll plop a small drop of Quicksilver solder remover on the center of the die. I'm using Quicksilver because I have a fair bit of it on hand. If I didn't have Quicksilver handy, I could use Liquid Metal Tim for the cleaning step just as well. Using a lint-free electronic swab, I'll spread the Quicksilver out across the full surface of the die. After it's been fully covered, I'll leave it sitting just like this for 10 to 15 minutes. Once the time has passed, I'll use more swabs to gently nudge and scrape the solder from the surface. 
At the point where rubbing the surface starts to feel smoother, I'll use paper towels, regular Q-tips, and 91% isopropyl alcohol to clean the surface as thoroughly as possible. If there's still solder after cleaning, I'll repeat these steps until no more indium remains. Sometimes it just takes two or three passes using this method. At this point, the CPU looks like this. After a second pass, it looks like this. There are still two small islands of solder that should be removed before moving to the polishing step, but I'm going to leave them there to show you what it looks like if you don't remove them prior to polishing. My polishing paste of choice is the Flitz Metal Polish and Cleaner, which is the same paste the Rocket Cool folks use as part of their delitting process. I'll dab a small bit on a strip of microfiber eyeglass cleaning cloth and slowly work in circles to clean the dye surface. This step usually takes a few times to clean adequately as well. You can see as I start to smooth the surface of the dye with the polish that the areas of indium I left turn a slightly blackish color. It should really be your goal to go into polishing with all of the indium removed, but if you do find yourself with a thin section of it still on the dye, it isn't the end of the world. Here's how it looks after two passes of polishing. What was a hazy and cloudy appearance is now a mirror finish. Now I'll use some alcohol on a paper towel to clean the entire surface of the tape as well as the CPU die, and then remove the tape holding the CPU in place. Next up is removing the gasket from around the perimeter of the CPU. I use a combination of a plastic straight edge tool and orange wood nail sticks to scrape the material free. I'll also add a small swatch of tape in one corner of the CPU just to give some additional hold on the component so it doesn't fly out while I'm cleaning it. In the corners with the SMDs, I always orient the CPU like so and scrape in parallel to the SMD's location. And never scrape in this direction toward the SMDs. This is a time-consuming but not difficult step in the process of preparing the CPU for direct die cooling. The way I go about doing this is to hold the CPU at an angle so that ambient light in the room reflects onto the surface of the CPU such that I can very easily see where there is material remaining that needs to be removed. As needed, I'll use a soft bristled watercolor paintbrush to gently broom the glue bits off the surface. Once all the glue has been removed, it's time to hit everything with alcohol and Q-tips. If I find an area that I missed, I'll clean it up now. It's very important with direct dye cooling to remove as much of this material as possible. And here's what the CPU looks like after cleaning. That completes the process for delitting an Intel 14th generation CPU. From here, you can decide what kind of cooling solution to apply to maximize your system's cooling performance. I'd recommend at least checking out the Iceman Direct Dye Water Block, as I've had great performance from that product. I hope you've enjoyed this demonstration. Thanks for watching, and out.